Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to our meeting on engaging national leaders and communities to protect adolescents against malaria. We have a wonderful panel and presentations for you today to delve into this unexplored topic. Thank you very much for joining so promptly. Uh, we'd like to start our event today with a short message from the UNICEF Goodwill Ambassadress and Grammy Award winner, uh, Angelique Kijo. Nous savons que le paludisme tue les enfants de moins de 5 ans. Mais saviez-vous que cette maladie est également l'une des cinq principales causes de décès chez les adolescents en Afrique et en Asie du Sud-Est En Afrique de l'Ouest et du Centre, où le fardeau du paludisme est le plus lourd, il est la deuxième cause de problème de santé chez les filles âgées de 15 à 19 ans. Les filles, mais en particulier les adolescentes, sont plus vulnérables au paludisme non seulement en raison de facteurs physiques liés à la puberté et aux grossesses précoces, mais aussi à cause des responsabilités ménagères dont elles ont la charge, telles que chercher de l'eau et du bois à l'aube et au crépuscule, période propice aux piqûres de moustiques. Certaines pratiques culturelles néfastes les exposent également, comme le fait de dormir à l'extérieur de la maison familiale pendant leurs règles. Et elles sont encore plus vulnérables lorsqu'elles sont enceintes. En effet, une infection paludéenne pendant la grossesse peut être mortelle pour la maman et son enfant à naître. Chaque année, Le paludisme est la cause de mortalité de plus de 10 000 filles et femmes enceintes, principalement en Afrique. En Afrique également, un bébé sur cinq est mort né consécutivement à un paludisme pendant la grossesse. Lorsque le bébé survit, il présente souvent un petit poids à la naissance, ce qui peut affecter négativement son futur développement physique et mental. Il existe cependant des solutions simples, peu coûteuses et efficaces pour protéger la mère et le bébé de cette terrible conséquence. Un petit comprimé pris au moins trois fois pendant la grossesse de maman peut aider à sauver la vie des femmes enceintes et de leur bébé. Dirigeants nationaux, chers parents et soignants, je vous demande de veiller à ce que nous ne perdions pas nos filles et nos femmes enceintes et leurs bébés à cause du paludisme. S'il vous plaît, développez des services scolaires et communautaires adaptés aux adolescents. Des services qui fournissent des informations sur les effets nocifs du paludisme et sur les moyens de le prévenir et traiter afin que nous puissions y mettre fin définitivement. S'il vous plaît, engagez-vous à mettre fin au mariage précoce et à éduquer nos filles sur l'importance d'éviter des grossesses précoces. L'UNICEF soutient la campagne « Accélérer la mise à l'échelle du traitement préventif intermittent » TPIP. Je souhaite que vous ajoutiez également la vôtre. Je vous remercie. Valentina, you're on mute. I hope you enjoyed that video as, as much as I did. Um, and as you noted, it was in French. So I'd like to remind you that we do have interpretation into French and Portuguese. If you click on the small world symbol at the bottom of your screens, uh, you can choose your channel either in English, French, or Portuguese. Um, you'll also find in the chat the link to to the letter to speed up the scale up of IPTP. And we do hope you will join your voices and your signature to that letter. I'd now like to delve down into some of the facts and figures that Angelique uh, made allusion to uh, through a very short presentation uh, that I hope will help guide you through our, the beginning of our topic today uh, around malaria in adolescence. So we all know that the deadly toll of malaria. We know that in 2020, in 2020 there were 241 million cases, uh, which led to 627,000 deaths, of which 80% were in children under five. We are now back to the unfortunate deadly toll of losing a child to malaria every minute. 
There have, however, been some very good news, and we know that since the beginning of the millennium, the global malaria community has successfully reduced the overall death toll from malaria by over 60%. The focus has, of course, been on children under the age of five and pregnant women who continue to be the hardest hit by the disease. Between 2012 and 2016, the death toll from malaria from children under five fell by 12%. However, there have been minimal gains in reducing malaria deaths among adolescents, be they boys or girls, in whom the death toll from malaria fell by just 3% in both Sub-Saharan Africa and Southeast Asia. If we go down into some of the very specific figures around this, we know that malaria is the fifth cause of disability for all girls aged between 10 and 19 years old. In West and Central Africa, which bears the highest burden of malaria, we see that it is the greatest cause of disability for girls aged 15 to 19, it is the second cause of disability for girls aged age 15 to 19, and it is the fourth cause of death and third cause of disability amongst girls 10 to 14 in East and Southern Africa. For boys, we know that it is the fifth cause of death, um, age 10 to 14, and the fourth cause of disability in the same age group. And in West and Central Africa, it is the fifth cause of death for boys age 15 to 19 and the fourth cause of disability in the same group. We see the same unfortunate toll in East and Southern Africa, where it is the fourth cause of death and fourth cause of disability amongst boys age 10 to 14. If we look at some of the very specifics, adolescent girls, and especially ad adolescent girls experiencing a first pregnancy, may be especially vulnerable to malaria as they may hide or delay revealing a pregnancy and attending antenatal care, especially if they have been raped, abused, or any other stigma that may cause them to hide their pregnancy. They may have missed malaria information due to being absent from school, possibly due to malaria caregiving when their siblings or their parents may be ill, or helping, or they may have aged out of malaria initiatives that target younger children. In complex operating environments that are unfortunately prevalent in Southeast Asia and Sub-Saharan Africa, this can be made worse as girls may be malnourished, they may be at intensified risk of sexual exploitation, and the pressures of complex operating environments may have intensified harmful traditional practices such as early or forced marriage. We know that COVID-19 had a deadly toll on malaria, and in particular, it was the disruption of essential services, such as antenatal checkups and family planning, that did not allow access by uh, women and adolescent girls to have these essential services. We also saw disruptions in malaria case management, unfortunately. So even the wellness checks for children and or adults, or care seeking through integrated community case management, or other opportunities to find malaria in all age groups, were also disrupted. Pregnant women are at higher risk of presenting malaria complications, including anemia, spontaneous abortion, stillbirths, premature delivery, low birth weight, ne uh, low birth weight neonates, and mortality due to the complications of being infected with malaria during pregnancy. Young and teenage mothers are also at higher risk of pregnancy complications, and if infected with malaria, they face a compound set of risk factors that further endangers their lives as well as that of their babies. The disruption of malaria programs, including lack of delivery of insecticide-treated nets, lack of access to diagnostic treatments, had devastating effects on the health and well-being of the most vulnerable, including pregnant women. We knew that while we were tracking the disruptions due to COVID-19, that we could have doubled the mortality of young African children in the year, in the subsequent year. And we did see that as reported by the World Malaria Report, World Malaria Report 2021. We are also encouraging that as antenatal care and other essential services are brought back online following the recovery from COVID-19, that the provision of antenatal care is a great opportunity to prevent and treat malaria in pregnant women, especially through the provision of intermittent preventive treatment during pregnancy, IPTP in malaria endemic areas. UNICEF's health program is very specifically focused not only on children under five, but also growing into the adolescent age group. Our 2016-2030 strategy for health sets out two goals. One is to end preventable maternal, newborn, and child deaths, and to promote the health and development of all children, including adolescents. 
For us, it is incredibly important to prioritize the needs of the most deprived and most marginalized children and adolescents and ensure that we have a multi-sectoral approach to enhance their development and address the underlying causes and determinants of poor health outcomes. We are shifting towards a health system strengthening approach, in particular focusing on primary health care and building resilience including looking at risks and building in resilience into health system strengthening. What is most important for us is to ensure that we are engaging adolescent girls as active agents and partners in their own health care and health gains. It is important for them and it is important for their families. In particular, if we look at UNICEF's malaria strategy, we do an end-to-end -end support. So it's not only policy setting, but also delivery of commodities and ensuring that we are having the right risk communication and community engagement. UNICEF is governed by the Convention on the Rights of the Child, the Convention on the Elimination of All Forms of Discrimination Against Women, the CEDAW, and the Core Commitments for Children, which includes adolescents. All of these measures include improved nutritional status, of women and children through appropriate prevention and treatment, promotion and immediate exclusive breastfeeding for the first six months of life as a, breast, as a best practice, malaria prevention through the use of insecticide treated bed nets, access to quality primary education, particularly for girls, and access to quality health service along the continuum of care, including immunizations and including antenatal care. We also focus on the provision of safe water and sanitation, education and prevention of HIV AIDS, including the prevention of mother to child transmission, and protection protocols which address trafficking, child labor, and harmful traditional practices such as early marriage. I thank you very much and I look forward to your questions and your comments as we move into the panel part of this presentation. I'd now like to introduce our wonderful panelists who will be, who will be uh, discussing with me some of the new opportunities that we have to prevent malaria in adolescents. Our three panelists today are Dr. Mercy Mugwangi, who is the Chief Administrative Secretary of the Ministry of Health in Kenya. She works as the Chief, uh, in this role as Chief Administrative Secretary, she supports the Cabinet Secretary in providing oversight and stewardship in the implementation of health sector policies and in building collaborative partnerships with a diverse range of sector stakeholders. She is fanatically positive and militantly optimistic. We also have Ms. Jocelyn Newcomb, who has more than 25 years of experience leading the design management and evaluation of successful family planning, maternal health, malaria, nutrition, eye health, tuberculosis, child survival, HIV, and other public health programs in emerging market contexts. Welcome, Jocelyn. Welcome, Mercy. We also have Ms. Cynthia Yu, who is the Youth Observer to the United Nations. She engages in global affairs over the year 2021 to 2022. And in this role, she engages young Americans in the work of the United Nations to amplify their voices at UN events during her one-year term. Welcome, Cynthia, and thank you very much for, to all three of you for joining us on this panel. I'd like to start the panel, panel off by asking Dr. Mercy, what is the malaria burden among adolescents in Kenya? Thank you. Um, thank you, uh, Valentina, um, for that question. And uh, thank you um, to UNICEF and all organizers for providing for us a platform to be able to discuss this uh, pertinent issue. Uh, before I dive down to the burden of malaria in adolescents in Kenya, um, let me paint a broader picture of what the situation looks like in terms of malaria in Kenya. Um, and it's, it's double-edged. On a positive side, um, re most recently, one of our most recent surveys, uh, the Kenya Malaria Indicator Survey done in the year 2020 showed us that uh, malaria uh, prevalence has declined by 2% in Kenya. So from 8% in 2015, to now 6% uh, 2020, and that's good. That's, that's a good measure of the work that has been put in when it comes to malaria programming, when it comes to ensuring that the different uh, numerous interventions are applied to ensure that fewer Kenyans suffer from malaria. Now, if we look at malaria in pregnancy, yes, uh, malaria remains one of the key drivers of mortality, of maternal mortality. If we look at um, malaria's contribution to stillbirths in Kenya, we can see it's still high, um, accounting for almost 20% of all stillbirths in Kenya. Uh, when we look at the case of neonatal deaths um, and contribution of malaria, they're again very high at 11%. And so really malaria is still um, 
you know, what we would call perhaps um, a key driver of mortality within the country, and particularly amongst young children. And of course, then this carries on when it comes to teenage pregnancies. Um, Kenya, um, particularly when we look at our trends for the past uh, 20 years or so, uh, we see that we have close to two out of 10 girls who end up, um, you know, in, in early pregnancies and, you know, are able to, you know, get pregnant uh, through different uh, social cultural factors, uh, you know, economic uh, factors, socioeconomic factors. Uh, the bottom line being that two out of 10 girls, um, you know, do get pregnant between the ages of 15 to 19. And of course, we have to understand that uh, teenage girls, you know, are at a stage where they have high nutritional needs in terms of intake of iron, um, you know, intake of folic acid and many other micronutrients which they need for their growing bodies. Now, if we place this against the backdrop of looking at, you know, the burden of malaria in Kenya and looking at particularly the effects of malaria in pregnancy, then clearly we can see that uh, teenage girls are quite vulnerable. Uh, one, seeing as that we have two out of 10 of them uh, getting pregnant and two, uh, recognizing the high nutritional needs that they have, but also their health seeking behavior. Uh, like you mentioned, Valentina, teenage girls are less likely to go seek um, care in a hospital. Um, they're less likely to attend antenatal clinics. Um, they're less likely to be compliant even with IPT uh, management. They're less likely to be compliant with all the different interventions that we need to manage malaria. And so the case is the same here in Kenya. When we look at our, um, our, our adolescent birth rate, um, it stands at about 96 per 1,000. That's almost double of uh, what it looks like globally. So again, um, a risk factor. And when we look at um, different surveys that have tried to intimate to us this health-seeking behavior, it's clear amongst the women cohorts, uh, younger girls are less likely to go to the ANC clinic and are less likely um, to you know, participate in the, the different, uh, different modalities that we have. When we look at um, the causes, particularly amongst adolescents, um, we do notice that malaria is amongst the two top causes of mortality amongst adolescents, younger adolescents particularly, and that one in four, and that's about 24%, uh, you know, if you look at our demographic, uh, you know, indices in Kenya, um, particularly in terms of population, we have close to 24%, um, you know, of Kenyans being adolescents. So again, a huge burden in terms of those who would be afflicted, particularly when you look at those who do become pregnant. Um, in terms of our last Kenya National Health uh, demographic, demographic Survey, and we are doing one this year, so this data is a little bit old, but we were able to tell that close to 40% of, of, of these um, adolescents you know, were pregnant or had just delivered and um, were contributing to close to 10,000 maternal deaths. So clearly um, the burden is high, um, the need to actually scale up treatment, the need to actually focus on this um, cohort is quite important at this point. And, and, and Kenya has put aside, you know, some strategies in terms of how we're doing this. And I think I'll be able to share with you, Valentina, um, when you get to that point. Thank you. Asante sana, Dr. Mercy, and thank you for setting us uh, the stage. Uh, as we go to our next two panelists, uh, we are welcoming all of you who are joining us from around the world. And please do feel free to put your questions for any of us in the chat or in the Q&A, and we will look forward uh, to answering them during the course of our presentation. Jocelyn, please tell us, what do we know about adolescents and malaria in the border regions of Asia? Thank you, Valentina. And, and thank you so much for this opportunity to join an all-female panel uh, discussing adolescence and, and malaria. Asia Pacific is, um, is a really interesting region. And I think um, the data that you shared with us at the beginning of, of today's session really highlights the geographic, you know, the range of geographic and epidemiological challenges before us. Asia is a region that has made tremendous progress toward eliminating uh, malaria in the last 20 years with a 63% reduction in cases and an 87% reduction in mortality related to malaria. So the, the NMPs, the National Malaria Programs and the civil society partners who are supporting them deserve um, tremendous credit for this progress. What's important to remember is that despite this progress, we still have 300 million individuals, including adolescents at risk of malaria in Asia Pacific. And we also have 51% of the global burden of Vivax malaria uh, in Asia Pacific. So as the region accelerates efforts to achieving its target of eliminating malaria by 2030, the last mile adolescents and other communities at risk 
which, um, which are critical to, to serving and engaging with to achieve that target are very often mobile, migrant, and displaced communities along the border areas and in other forest exposed areas. I think it's important to recognize that adolescents in Asia and, and in fact, adolescents in any region are not a homogeneous group, right? It's a very diverse group and, and their, their needs um, vary um, by age, by gender, by ethnicity, by school status. Um, there are lots of different, um, uh, you know, distinct, I think, issues for all of us to purposefully consider when we put adolescents at the, the center of effective uh, elimination and malaria control programming. And that is certainly true um, among uh, these mobile migrant and displaced communities with adolescents and other uh, adults at risk of malaria in the Asia Pacific. I think that it's important to, um, to understand that um, the way that the pandemic has exacerbated the, the risk for adolescents in Asia Pacific. Asia is a region which has experienced prolonged uh, periods of restrictions and quite, um, quite significant restrictions, including multiple months of complete school closures. And we have some um, initial data from Asia Pacific from multiple countries in the greater Mekong subregion, for example, which suggests that um, with the extended school closures, uh, adolescents may have uh, increased their forest exposure, right? Their time spent with their family and other community members in the forest farming or foraging, or perhaps searching for connectivity to um, stay engaged with um, virtual education and, and other social engagements. So I think, you know, we are, we are just beginning to unpack um, the implications of the pandemic for Asia's um, continued progress towards elimination. And I'd like to also emphasize, um, uh, as has as already been mentioned, that the gendered aspects of, uh, of adolescence and, and malaria are quite significant. We know that in Asia Pacific, whereas the majority of the cases are among males, including um, adolescent males and, and young men, um, but we also know that, as is the case in, in Africa, that adolescent girls are less likely to seek uh, prompt care for malaria symptoms. And there are a range of, of gendered barriers to, to both malaria prevention um, and as well as, as test and treat services. And until we you know, are able to, to empower girls and also address and create more equitable systems at household, community, and health system, levels, um, uh, we, have, we have more work to do. Thank you. Thank you so much, Jocelyn, for, for saying, for laying out uh, those aspects. Uh, we'll now go to, to Cynthia. And, and um, Jocelyn just talked about empowering women. So I'd like to ask you, how can we empower and what is the importance of Generation Z in advocating for SDG three, which which encompasses the progress towards ending malaria for good. Absolutely. Well, Valentina, first, I just want to say thank you so much for having me. Thank you to UNICEF and the organizers. It's such an honor to be here today with all of you and to be on a panel with Jocelyn and Mercy as well. Um, and so especially I want to first also acknowledge that right now we have the ongoing UN Commission on the Status of Women. And today is also World Water Day. And so thinking about the intersections with all these really important UN events going on is incredibly uh, impactful to think about how we can intersect all the different UN SDGs. Now, with regards to how we can empower young people for the SDGs, it's always been the crux of the issue. And I remember at the beginning of my term, I conducted a national listening tour in which I listened to over a thousand young people and collected data from them in the span of two weeks. And what I found is that young people are leading the charge for the UN SDGs, and they are leading the charge for change, especially in for SDG three as well. They shared with me that the number one domestic priority they saw was SDG 10, reduced inequalities. And according to the Global Fund for Malaria, the poorest, the least educated, and rural groups reported lower levels of timely care seeking for children under the age of five running a fever for malaria cases. And malaria cases are often found in our world's poorest, most vulnerable regions. It's important to our world's children who are in general the, eight, uh, the age group with the least amount of rights and representation to stand up for them 
especially as Generation Z, as they are within our generation and people who experience many of the same challenges that we face today. And so empowering young people in Generation Z and vice versa, Gen Z empowering others within Gen Z is incredibly important to addressing malaria and the challenges that impacts it. I really believe that our generation can make a difference to reduce inequalities and end malaria. And I know one of the questions really is, why Gen Z? And I think that in just a short amount of time, our generation has, un has had unique, unprecedented levels of influence. Gener generation Z has been at the forefront of change. And when we look at other issues, including SDG 13, climate action, uh, we see people like Yeta Thunberg, who has made such incredible progress on this front. All she did was sit outside of parliament. All she did was hold up a poster. And all she did was tell her friends to do the same. But the world caught fire and soon 6 million young people from across the globe filled the streets, sat outside of government buildings and struck against their schools. It was one of the largest international movements in history. And it wasn't because she had a giant funding machine backing her. It wasn't because she initially had any fame. It wasn't because she started with millions of followers. All she had in the beginning was her voice and she used it. And like Greta, we in Generation Z can use our young, our voices to lead the charge for change because we have capacity, reach, and influence. And so I'm going to stop there, but I genuinely believe that Generation Z has these unique capabilities to create change and advocate for malaria, especially in light of all these UN events going on, including this Commission on the Status of Women and World Water Day. Thanks, thanks so much, Cynthia, and what, and what a wonderful and, and vibrant presentation that really sort of brings all of these uh, new areas uh, to the charge. So I'd like to, before I, I do another round of questions for our wonderful female, all female panelists, uh, please uh, do put your questions in the, in the Q&A and we'll ensure and we'll make sure that we address them. Um, my next question is to Dr. Mercy again. Um, you were charged with the design of the essential health benefit package for Kenya. And, are, and as mentioned by Jocelyn, we are not dealing with a homogenous population. Are there specific adolescents that are more impacted by malaria in Kenya? And what are their specific risks that we could do leveraging the experience of Kenya? We have a question from Cameroon who would like to learn from Kenya about what can we do to put adolescents front and center in our malaria package. Dr. Mercy, over to you. Thank you. Thank you, Valentina. And um, yes, uh, Jocelyn was correct. Um, certainly the picture is not homogeneous. Um, even within um, the country, we actually have um, different geographical disparities when it comes to the burden of malaria within Kenya. Um, and additionally, when it comes even to the rates of teenage pregnancy across the country, and when it comes to also um, different socioeconomic um, demographic factors across the country. Um, we have, uh, as a country, uh, you know, particularly been able to uh, identify what would be known as a vulnerability index. Where do we need to focus more? Um, where do we have a higher burden? Where do we have uh, young girls being more at risk? And so that's part of the strategy. You, you have to map it out. You have to perhaps uh, uh, have a priority list because it, it, it's important to be able to channel resources to the most impactful regions and areas within the country. Um, for sure, uh, by virtue one, um, you know, we always say, and, and, and here I'll, I'll digress as a doctor, you know, pregnancy in of itself is a condition that you need to, you know, properly um, observe the mother and ensure that she's well taken care of because there are inherent risks, uh, you know, just by the virtue of being pregnant. Add on then um, being pregnant um, as a young girl, of course, again, uh, a burden there beyond her own, um, you know, economic, socioeconomic um, development, that of, you know, the young body um, that is still developing, there's greater needs. Um, nutritional needs as a teenager, but also now greater needs as she's pregnant. Then put this young girl, you know, in a malaria endemic zone of the country where, you know, you have high burden of malaria. Then this double, this is now a double burden of disease. You know, she has to struggle with one, the teenage pregnancy. Um, and then of course, um, the idea of being in a high, high malaria burden uh, part of Kenya. And so clearly um, identifying this risk, this dual risk amongst teenagers is important. And then, of course, um, ensuring that we have the proper allocation of resources. You mentioned um, the health benefit package. Yes, while we were designing the health benefit package for our UHC program in Kenya, 
we did take into account one, um, you know, the number of, of, of teenage girls that we have, um, their geographical distribution in the country in terms of malaria. And one of the beautiful things that came out of this process is that we've been able to integrate malaria uh, within the different reimbursement channels um, of our health insurance cover, which is known as NHIS. And so a young girl in a specific part of the country is able to access um, healthcare and of course have her financial burden and that of her family reduced um, through this program of UHC. And, and, and beyond that, of course, there are many other interventions. I think it's important, particularly uh, today that we underscore um, the importance of IPT therapy. It's, it's, it's definitely one of the key game changers and we need to put in place mechanisms to ensure that this young girl who's already in such disparate conditions is able to attend her ANC visits, is supported to attend her ANC visits. And within those visits, she's able to get her three doses, uh, you know, one, one every month of IPT therapy. It's absolutely crucial. And of course, coupled with all the other interventions, including ensuring she has her net issued to her, including that she has her links with the community health workers, if ever there's an issue in terms of her pregnancy, to be able to access the care that she needs. So clearly um, this young girl is at risk and I'm really glad to be engaging in this panel today where we are trying to discuss and share ideas in terms of how we protect her and how we ensure that you know, we have good outcomes from the pregnancy, but also for herself as a young girl. And, and, and I do like what um, Cynthia said, um, so many UN events happening. So really um, the focus is on this young girl and, and, and let's pull her out of this. And you know, all the efforts that are put in, particularly when it comes to policy and, and, and in service delivery do need to be integrated. One key thing that Kenya is very lucky is, uh, about is that our president is actually um, the chair of ALMA. This is the Africa Malaria Initiative. And through this initiative, we've been able to put in place what we are calling youth interventions. So interventions that are geared specifically to the youth. And one of the ones that is really giving us good results is that, that we're calling a malaria army. So we have a youth malaria army. These are young people in the community who are, who are able to offer their time, voluntary services, to do different um, malaria uh, management activities in the community. So it includes draining, waterways, it includes, um, you know, cutting of bushes, it includes um, indoor residual spraying for areas that require IRS. And so that's, that's a movement that we've seen um, sort of also coupled with advocacy. You're having a lot of young people discussing malaria in their groups, but also advocating in communities, and this has gone a long way. And, the, and then again, through um, the chairmanship of the president, we are looking at putting resources towards research, particularly for those young people who are in universities, um, who are looking at new innovative ways of using data when it comes to malaria programming. And we do have a program that is setting off within the country where we're working with um, different partners, um, Stanford University and other partners, to be able to look at how we layer data and, 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 and particularly with the young people who are very adept at this, um, sort of getting into data analytics and triangulation of data. So looking at malaria programming data and extending it out towards um, other forms of data sources that we have in the country to see if we can do better for malaria. Thank you. Wonderful. Thank you so much for all those all those fantastic ideas and also for answering some of our questions in the in the chat. Um, and just to let you know, I'm a testament to the Kenyan health system. Both my children were actually born in Kenya, so they're very proudly born in Nairobi. Um, Jocelyn, over to you. Um, you mentioned um, that there are very homogeneous groups and you brought us back to the gender aspect um, that we are talking about teenage girls, but we also have to deal with teenage boys. Cynthia raised the, the, the problems of inequity. So what can we do in the Asia Pacific region to really start to meet the health needs of these adolescent girls and boys and, and protect them from malaria? Jocelyn, over to you. Thank you, Valentina. I think, you know, everything, every solution starts with putting adolescents at the center of, of malaria programming. And when we do that, we automatically um, will understand and, and respect the, the nuanced differences, right, between these different subgroups and, and segments. And I think that, you know, understanding those nuances is, 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 is the first step towards um, empowering uh, change and, and improved health outcomes. When we do that, we're also, um, I think, going to be led to some successful approaches that have worked in Asia Pacific and are, and are still being utilized here. Um, and those include um, uh, uh, building trust at community level, using multi-sectoral approaches. Um, I think that you know, Mercy has highlighted uh, the importance of using peer networks, which are, which are critical um, also in Asia. 
Um, and I, I just want to, you know, to also emphasize that, you know, meeting the needs of, of adolescents also requires engaging with, with their influencers and, 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 you know, others in their social circle. So parents could be teachers if they're in school, um, it could be other community members. And, and one of the successful approaches or um, promising approaches, perhaps it's more safe to, to call it in Asia Pacific is a multi-sectoral approach engaging with some of the environment, um, environmental groups at community level. We know that adolescents um, are, are maybe unlikely to seek care from the public health systems, at least in, initially. And, and what that means for all of us committed to malaria control and elimination is that uh, strong health systems are necessary, but not sufficient necessarily to meeting the needs of adolescents. And in Asia, we have um, several cases where collaboration between health, environment, um, sometimes education, security, trade, those types of, of collaborative um, efforts are yielding positive results. And a great example of that um, in Cambodia, for example, where some of the civil society uh, organizations are partnering with the community forest rangers to reach adolescents and other last mile communities at risk of malaria. And through that type of multi-sectoral collaboration, we can make the malaria information, prevention, test and treat services that adolescents and other last mile communities need more accessible. Thank you. Wonderful, thank you so much, Jocelyn. And thank you for also bringing us uh, to the fact that we do need to reach out also to the private sector and to leverage this multi-sectoral opportunity. Um, which brings us to, to a good question to, to Cynthia. So Jocelyn mentioned influencers. She mentioned other ways of peer-to-peer -peer networkers. And you as an influencer, you have this incredible platform as the Youth Observer to the United Nations. Uh, what other opportunities do we have to really ensure that the aspects of Generation Z uh, are unique in their ability to fight change? What, what else can we do to really engage them and, and bring them on board? You heard Dr. Mercy uh, mentioning the Youth Malaria Army and these other opportunities. So Cynthia, over to you as our malaria influencer. Thank you so much, Valentina. Absolutely. I mean, to kind of go back on something that I discussed earlier, it really is about that capacity, reach, and influence. And so when we talk about ways that we can galvanize others in Generation Z, I really think it's about bringing in our friends, our peers, others into this fight for change. I think that what makes Generation Z so unique in our ability to serve as leaders really is our status as young people. Instead of waiting for the greatest issues to be solved tomorrow, we're the generation that's tackling those problems today. And there's a lot of research to back this up. Experts have found that young people have had unprecedented levels of influence because of their capacity to serve as influential change makers, uh, this influential reach and beyond the political sphere, and the influence over their peers as well. So when we look at the capacity, young people comprise about a quarter of the world's population, and that's more than the entire populations of the US and China combined. And we that means that we have an extraordinary potential to influence each other and other generations in unrivaled volumes. And researchers at Harvard University have noted that in the past 20 years, young people have led the top campaigns for social change. And we can do the exact same thing with this uh, unity to fight and beat malaria. When we look at outreach, an MIT professor found that young people, especially young immigrants, often have direct social ties with others around the globe. And when people feel connected, they're more likely to change not only laws, but also minds. And that sits at the heart of every great movement. And then we, when we look at our way to influence others, in 2019, I was able to work with UNICEF and the EU to launch the Real Challenges social media campaign. And we asked students to champion for the greatest challenges facing women and children. This resulted in over 450 million engagements across over 50 countries. And it was recognized by the European Parliament as the first child rights campaign made in a language children all over the world actually understand, youth communicating with youth. So simply put, nobody communicates better with other young people than other young people. Nobody can navigate the emerging technology platforms better than young people, better than other young people. And nobody can empathize with the burden placed upon vulnerable, vulnerable youth better than other young people. So ways that we can continue 
uniting to beat malaria really is is honoring uh, honing in on how we can use this capacity outreach and influence to bring in others from generation z and from other generations as well so things like using social media to spread the word about malaria and using statistics from unicef and other organizations that really paint a picture of what's going on around the world using our voices to advocate to others i remember back when i was with unicef usa we had a story of a particular senator who was on the Appropriations Committee. And this senator refused to ever meet with anybody from UNICEF until a group of high school students reached out to their office and asked to meet with them about UNICEF. Every year after that, the senator ended up meeting with UNICEF uh, supporters and UNICEF officials because the senator realized after talking to young people that this is something that Generation Z cares about and something that people in the state care about. So really, as young people, we have the capacity, outreach and influence to make a difference. And we can use our voices as grassroots advocates uh, by leading marches and by spreading information on our social media platforms and also by capital A advocates by talking to our officials and using our status as young people to make a case for why malaria prevention is so critical to the global goals. Thank you so much, Cynthia. And, and I think that leads well to, to a reminder to all, all, all on us, all with us on this webinar to please sign the declaration. The, the link is in the chat. You know, this is really important that we raise our collective voice that again, we make a strong push to, to get our national leaders. Um, and with that, I, I come back to, to Dr. Mercy. You know, we have an incredible opportunity with with, uh, with President Kenyatta as head of ALMA, the uh, the Malaria Youth Army. What else can we do to stop the dual cycle of teenage pregnancies and malaria throughout Kenya? What other opportunities? How else can we empower uh, our colleagues on this webinar, uh, working in other countries, to stop the cycle of this dual burden? Over to you, Dr. Mercy. Thank you, thank you, Valentina. And um, I think I, I would definitely say that we do need to have a multi-sectoral approach when it comes to malaria. I think one of our panelists did mention um, the different intersections of what is going on in the world today. Today is World Water Day. Um, do know water um, plays a huge role in the transmission cycle of malaria. And so it's important somehow, I think that, you know, the multi-sectoral approach is adopted. And because we're discussing young people here, it would be good um, to, to sort of, how do I say, have them also as part of that multi-sectoral approach. Um, young people, you know, uh, one, by virtue of, uh, I think the report that uh, Cynthia launched um, last year, are good communicators. And they're the ones who, who best communicate to other young people. I've, I've recently been engaged in different youth panels over the past uh, two weeks, actually. And I can tell you the language is different. Um, for you to be able to think a point, it's different. For you to be able to get a reaction, it's different. And so there has to be sort of that really central pillar um, as we look at the multisectoral approach beyond even you know the normative steps of service delivery, you know, you need to take your IPT, you need to go in for your ANCs, sort of need the youth seated there. And, it, and for us in Kenya, one of the things we've done, um, particularly with UNICEF, but also with UNFPA, is to have what is known as a youth advisory board. So they do sit at a table and they do review our policy initiatives and they do give back feedback in terms of, you know, is this policy aligned to um, what the youth need and, 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 and is it suitable? Does it make um, access of services feasible for them and, you know, easy? Is it easy for them to be able to access these services? I think uh, beyond the multisexual approach, there's, there's a need to appreciate the role that communities play. Um, at the end of the day, um, you know, um, communities, I think, are, are central to, you know, all countries. And so we do have to fashion um, initiatives, engagements at the community level. Um, in Kenya, I do know that we've engaged community health workers, um, particularly when it comes for IPT um, therapy, when it comes for ANC uh, follow-up visits, uh, when it comes for uh, folic acid um, supplementation in the school-based program, um, when it comes to iron supplementation as well. So all these programs um, sort of are central in the community. And by community, I don't just mean the neighbor who lives next to you or the community health worker, but I mean the school community, the social whole community, all these different regions where we have interactions as communities, we need to put in place um, some form of interventions in those spaces. We do have a good um, school-based program in Kenya through the support of UNICEF. It's a budding program, it's, it's growing, it's scaling. And um, again, 
you know, provides a huge, huge opportunity to be able to meet the youth in that space, meet the teachers who we know have a lot of contact time with these students and use those opportunities um, for the interventions that we need to be able to reduce this double burden um, for our adolescents. I think beyond that, um, I've seen a question on the role that influences uh, can play. Yes, indeed, in Kenya, we have used influencers, all kinds of influencers, those who do comedy, music, art, um, in the fight against malaria. I think um, last year we actually had paintings um, that were speaking of the zero malaria um, sort of uh, campaign. And so using all avenues and particularly those that touch on, on, on the public is important um, in terms of raising awareness and advocacy. I think also, um, you know, campaigns such as the one that we're talking about today, the Speed Up, Scale Up uh, campaign are important. Um, for sure, these campaigns do need to be perhaps disseminated and localized in different setups. I was trying to think about how I would translate this into the national language, that's the Swahili, so speed up, scale up. Um, and, and I think that's what needs to happen across you know, different countries and regions so that you know, the message is held and heard. And so indeed, uh, stopping the cycle requires a multisectoral approach, it requires a focus on community, it requires a center staging of the youth, um, and it requires um, perhaps at sometimes going outside of the policy box when it comes to health, you know, global health policy and you know, health sector policy. Thank you. Wonderful, thank you so much, Dr. Mercy. And I think you've set uh, Jocelyn well up for our, our last question for her, which is what more can we do on an integrated approach at the community level? And again, how do we put together the suggestions by Cynthia and both by Dr. Mercy about putting the adolescent at the center of these platforms? Jocelyn, over to you. Thank you, it's, it's a wonderful question, it's so important. I think that you know in Asia Pacific, as we are counting down toward the elimination target um, by 2030, it is um, it's very clear that business as usual is is not sufficient, right? We need um, we need to accelerate, we need to innovate, and we certainly need to elevate the voices and the perspectives of adolescents and other communities at risk. And I think that's a, a theme that's emerging um, from all of the presentations and, and remarks today. And I'm so glad to hear that coming through so clearly from all regions um, and all, all speakers. I think um, it's also important to understand that your vertical malaria programming is unlikely to meet the needs of adolescents. And, and we've all spoken about that in different ways. Um, adolescents have a range of, of health issues as, as, um, as Mercy has highlighted, right? Um, there are reproductive health needs, there are menstrual health needs, um, there are nutrition needs, there are a whole range of issues. And outside of health, adolescents are very oftentimes worried about non-health day-to-day um, -day issues, particularly in Asia Pacific, where we have uh, adolescents uh, in the border areas who are mobile, migrant, displaced, dealing with um, really difficult day-to-day uh, situation. So I think that you know, those realities need to be understood and respected and, and addressed uh, through a mixed health system approach, through a multi-collaboration uh, between different sectors. And, um, and civil society partners and private sector partners are um, can, can and should be uh, and continue to be part of the solution. And national health programs don't need to do this alone. Um, a, a collaborative approach is going to be much more effective uh, in the end, particularly for adolescents and other underserved communities who have distinct needs that may not be met by national health systems alone. Thank you. Thank you, Jocelyn. Um, we're beginning to, to head into the last 10 minutes of, of our panel. So um, one of the questions, that, one of the last questions before we start picking up questions from the, from the Q&A for Cynthia is you were really front and center of this listening tour. So again, SDG 10 and relating to beating malaria inequities. You've heard from Dr. Mercy and, and from Jocelyn that sometimes uh, we do need to target school adolescents who are in schools, but also those who are out. What are the opportunities that you've heard during this listening tour, and again, how do we ensure uh, adolescent participation um, and putting them again front and, and center into our work? Cynthia, over to you. Absolutely. Well, there are a variety of ways that young people can get involved with the UN and also the fight to beat malaria. One way is, like I said earlier, the direct advocacy, writing to their members of Congress and 
of just joining it in with the UN system. So within the United States, for example, there's UNICEF USA where you can volunteer and help UNICEF advocate, fundraise, and um, inspire others in pursuit of UNICEF and its life-saving work, especially in the field of malaria. There's also the UNA USA Youth Network where anybody under the age of 26 can join for free and help advocate for full UN funding and uh, advocate for the funding of UNICEF's work also uh, in the malaria sector as well. During my listening tour, the general sentiment I found was that young people just want to be heard. Young people didn't have a choice in the world that they inherited, but they do have a choice in the world they leave behind. And so it's critical that we you do everything that we can to leave behind a better world for our generation and the ones to come. And we really can make a difference. And so, like I said earlier, there's so much that we can do to advocate. And as young people, like I said, a lot of members of Congress really look to us as voters and as the next generation to hear about the things that we care about. So we can tell stories, our own, and then also the stories of those around the globe, things that we have seen on social media that previous generations haven't been able to see before and talk about what we're seeing around the globe and why it matters and how it it is an issue that specifically matters to the United States as well. When we talk about stories about what's happening around the globe, and when we think about the ways that we can contribute to a better, more sustainable future, it really makes all the difference. Young people don't necessarily have to be directly in the UN system. There are ways, I mean, for me, I'm not a STEM person, but I know that as a grassroots advocate and as somebody who wants to inspire others in Generation Z, using my voice as an advocate is the best way that I can make a difference. But there are others who are, for example, also in the STEM field, and they are doing so much critical research that is directly contributing to believe to beating malaria. And so regardless of what field or sector people are in, we can all make a difference to ensure that tomorrow is better than today. And so I think that uh, something that always sticks in my mind is a quote from Geta Thunberg again. And she once said that we showed that we are united and that we young people are unstoppable. And I think that we are. Definitely a force of nature, Cynthia. You are definitely unstoppable. Um, I'd like to close out the, the last seven minutes by another uh, round of closing remarks from each one of our, our panelists. Um, so we've had a couple of questions. I, I think we have done a, a good job of addressing, you know, how do we base, use school-based uh, platforms? How do we also target out of school? So using different methodologies, uh, looking at the different arsenal of what we will have to do vis-a-vis uh, -vis a collective uh, work to, to, uh, to really bring down uh, malaria in adolescence, because it is about tailoring the message. You've heard that there are opportunities to really encapsulate, to use a multi-sectoral, to use an, an integrated platform. You've heard that we have to use health systems, which is really end-to-end. -end. And one of the areas, some of the questions that have been popping up are about uh, supply availability. So how do we make that work? So one of the, one uh, area is advocacy and resource mobilization, because it is about purchasing commodities, uh, bringing them into countries and then actually ensuring that they get out. So again, into the communities that need them. So we will have to, we do work with the poorest and most marginalized communities. So that's really vital that we again, do this end to end. We've heard that we need to think uh, laterally, not only in the public health system, but also working with the private sector and what are the opportunities that we have to really um, work on tailoring some of our malaria strategies and, and using a full continuum. Um, so I'd like to, to start with, uh, with Dr. Mercy just for a quick one, two minute closing statement as we close out our panel. Thank you. Thank you, Valentina. And again, thank you to UNICEF um, for this opportunity and to all panelists. I, I myself have learned a lot, including how to do a presentation like that of Cynthia. So I'll be trying to do that. She can send some tips on how she got that running. Um, but I think in terms of closing statements for me is that um, even as we discuss all the various, you know, all the different um, interventions and you've, you know, rightly summarized them, it will be important um, you know, to look at the financing and particularly disaggregate um, financing baskets to how much money actually goes to the adolescent and malaria programming. And yes, I do agree, uh, vertical programs are not sustainable, but um, perhaps putting the money where our mouth is would be useful. Um, and so I think it's, an, it's a call to all, all, all you know, 
policymakers, to, to civil society, to government, to private sector, to public sector, to really ensure that that resource, that mobilization of financing is, is, is present for young people. Um, thank you. Thank you, Valentina. Wonderful. Thank you, Dr. Mercy. Jocelyn, over to you. Thank you, Valentina. I'd like to just end with a, a call to action for all of us working in this space to, um, to, to work to support the accelerated access to new uh, malaria prevention uh, diagnosis and treatment products, um, and to ensure that those new products that are coming down the pipeline uh, work for adolescents as well as other communities at risk. We know that the existing vector control products um, don't offer sufficient protection for forest exposed adolescents in Asia Pacific, for example. So what happens when um, an adolescent male goes to the forest and um, he's not gonna be protected under a bed net, right? He can't use a bed net in the forest and he's gonna be exposed in the forest during times when an insecticide treated hammock net isn't feasible. So we need new vector control uh, innovations. And we, we also need to address uh, the fact that the current radical cure for Vivax regimens are very challenging for adolescents and other communities at risk, right? 14 days um, is a long time and, uh, and, and the adherence issues are significant. We have new tools uh, for Vivax, um, including you know, better point of care, higher, uh, um, uh, higher specificity, higher sensitivity, G6PD deficiency screening tools, and also improve shorter regimens coming down uh, the pipeline and that those are all incredible innovations and we need to continue to work harder to make sure that the products that adolescents and other communities that need uh, at risk uh, need are accessible in, in the formats that they need them. Thank you. Thank you, Jocelyn. Cynthia, over to you. Yeah, well, I just want to first say thank you so much, Valentina, and also all the event organizers, APLMNA, uh, MMV, and Malaria No More UK, and UNICEF for having us here today and for holding this really critical discussion on ending malaria. So I would first say sign the petition in the chat. I know Vina has put it in a few times, but uh, it takes literally two seconds. I did it and it quite literally is so fast and so instantaneous. So if you are on this call, please take a look at the chat and sign the petition because every signature matters and there is power in numbers. And for all the young people in the world and also especially the young people in the United States, talk to your peers about ending malaria and talk about how it's still an issue that's impacting millions of children every, uh, every single year. Call your member of Congress to ask for full funding of the UN and for funding of UNICEF and its life-saving work. And as previous panelists have discussed, tailor your messages to your audience. Tell them about why this issue matters to them and to the world. And tell a story. There is power in the pictures and stories that you are able to evoke. Numbers only go so far. For many, once we start listing numbers, it's hard to put things into perspective. So put things into perspective by sharing individual stories. Tell your own personal one if it's something that's impacted you or your family and discuss ways that we can work together as Generation Z to create a better world moving forward. We're helping the communities that need support the most. And together, I really believe that we can unite together as a world to make a difference. Thank you so much, Cynthia. Thank you so much, Dr. Mercy. Thank you so much, Jocelyn. You know, it's been a really wonderful panel. Of, you know, female empowerment, break the bias this year. You know, we really have an incredible opportunity uh, to work together to end malaria and to end malaria not only for children, but also for adolescents. So thank you to all three of you for all the incredible work that you do. Thank you to the organizers. Thank you really to the Medicines for Malaria Venture, to the Asia Pacific Leaders Malaria Alliance, uh, to my colleagues at, at UNICEF, you know, and to all of the participants for joining us today. Um, I think it's been a wonderful learning experience of how, again, we communicate to adolescents, but also how we put them front and center in this fight against malaria. I wish you all a wonderful week. Thank you very much for joining us today and looking forward to staying in touch with you to speed up the scale up of IPTP and end malaria for good.